Welcome and good afternoon. I'm Paula Meyer and I'll be facilitating our discussion today on board compensation practices. As directors, we know our roles are evolving. Our traditional responsibilities are still there, of course, working with the CEO on business strategy, ensuring compliance, and providing audit, compensation, and governance expertise. But we face new business risks coming from many directions, to name a few, setting compensation targets in the volatile environment partially created by the global pandemic, and more recently by the war in Ukraine, competing effectively for talent, providing insights as companies move from legacy systems to digital and cloud-based technology, ensuring cybersecurity controls remain as contemporary as possible, and facing new challenges as supply chains get reworked. You undoubtedly could name many more topics that didn't find their way into the boardroom 10 years ago, but are front and center today. Facing these challenges as a director requires both experience and commitment to work in new ways. And it requires more of your time. I suspect, and our experts will weigh in, that board compensation will be an increasingly important topic as boards work hard to recruit future-ready directors. Today, I'm joined by Pete Lupo, and Ryan Horahan, Managing Directors with Pearl Meyer. They are going to share some important early data from the forthcoming Pearl Meyer NACD Director Compensation Report, and will highlight some emerging trends that warrant discussion in future board meetings. Before we dig in, the NACD education team has a few short housekeeping notes, and then Ryan will kick off our program. Thank you, Paula. We have a few administrative announcements before we get started. First, I'll talk about the tools you have available in your webinar console. On the left-hand side of your console, you can see all of today's panelists and access their bios. In the top right-hand corner of your webinar console, you can submit a question to be answered by our speakers during the program, time permitting. Please note that if you submit a question, you will be opted in to receive Future Executive Compensation Thought Leadership from Pearl Meyer. And in the bottom right corner, you can download a copy of today's slide deck and access additional resources. Today's slide deck is also available on pearlmeyer.com at the URL on your screen. As always, a recording of this webinar will be available early next week at both nacdonline.org slash webinars and pearlmeyer.com. Your participation in today's live webinar earns you credit toward maintaining your NACD credential. <clears throat> NACD fellows and certified directors will automatically receive one credit for their participation. Please note that you must attend this webinar for at least 50 minutes in order to receive credit. Finally, we will have a few evaluation questions at the very end of the program, and we would appreciate your feedback. So please stick around at the end of the webcast to answer those questions. And now I'd like to turn it over to our next presenter, Ryan, to get us started. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Paula, for, for joining us today. And thank you, everybody on the, on the phone. Pete and I are excited to be talking to you all about this interesting topic of director compensation. The first topic we're going to cover here is kind of the, the current environment we see in the boardroom. I think Paula hit it pretty well, but I'm, I'm going to kind of back her up on some of those comments. Uh, we're certainly seeing enhanced pressure on boards in several areas. Um, this shift to, you know, deciding whether or not we're returning to in-person work or are we truly moving to a uh, more virtual world going forward, the highly talented and competitive um, marketplace for talent. Um, coupled with the pressures of the Great Resignation, supply chain issues that are being exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, as well as COVID-19, and the impending um, fear of economic slowdown, um, given kind of the record year some companies have had coming out of COVID. 
as a result of these changes, directors are being asked to step up and lead in different ways. You know, traditionally, it's been a focus on profitable growth, and while that focus is still there, we're certainly asking boards and directors to expand their purview. Um, this is bleeding into ESG, DE&I metrics, measurements, goals. Um, how are you weighting those things? Are they part of the incentive program for the executive team? If not, how are you communicating with shareholders that those are topics that are front uh, and center at the board level? Uh, looking more deeply at organizational culture, uh, organizational health, we've seen obviously coming out of COVID-19, uh, a lot of people shifting uh, where they're working, res resigning from current roles, uh, and a lot of that is driven by unhappiness uh, at the cultural level. So boards are being asked to, to be more influential there. Obviously, diversity is, has been a huge topic amongst uh, boards, both gender diversity and ethnic diversity. Um, for the last several years, that's not going away. Um, and obviously, the idea of succession planning. What COVID-19 has also brought to light is we need a, a, talent, uh, a talented bench to ensure if anything does happen to our senior management team, we have the right people to step in. Um, and as Paula mentioned, um, I think one thing that isn't captured on this list is this heightened sensitivity around goal setting and the heightened use of discretion amongst boards to determine incentive payouts uh, given times are, are, are somewhat still uncertain. Uh, despite all of the things that we have just mentioned now, uh, what we are seeing in terms of market practice regarding director compensation is fairly consistent with what we've seen over the last five to six years, which is essentially modest you know, year-over-year single-digit growth in total compensation. Next slide. For those of you on the call that uh, are familiar with the NACD compensation um, study that is published each year, this slide will look fairly, pretty familiar to you. Um, essentially, this is the way we bifurcate the NACD comp data in terms of how we report out. So we, we essentially divide the data into five separate size categories, uh, a micro cut, a small cut, a medium cut, a large cut, and then the top 200 cut. Um, please note that the, the the report today and the presentation today will focus largely on publicly traded firms given the access ability of that data through the proxy reports. That said, we have also added a, a couple additional slides in this um, that cover private company director compensation. Obviously, it's a little bit harder to get data on that, but Pearl Meyer has done some internal research uh, and we'll be reporting on that today as well. Next slide. slide. Slide seven here essentially is looking at the total direct compensation um, across all different size categories and then all firms. Um, as you can see for 2021, as we look across the all firm category, we saw a 3% year over year increase. And again, if you look back essentially to about 2014, it's a pretty consistent theme. The, the one major outlier, as you'll see on this chart, was the 2010 number. That was largely driven um, by coming out of the kind of 2009 recession, where we saw a slightly more um, significant impact to director compensation than we saw, let's say, during COVID. So there was a slightly bigger year-over-year -year pop that you saw in 2010. Um, obviously, we didn't see that in 2021 coming out of COVID. Um, but I think Paula mentioned this nicely in, in the start here. I think as we see the role of the director continue to expand, the scrutiny of the director's role continue to expand, I think you're going to find the pool of directors that are willing to stomach the workload and the scrutiny is going to diminish the pool, um, which in my estimation is going to lead to a more competitive landscape in regards to director compensation. That said, there is a, still a pretty prevailing, um, you know, approach in that most companies, unlike executive comp, where it tends to be somewhat all over the map, in, in regards to director compensation, most companies don't want to lead or lag the market. So you tend to see most of them kind of coalesce around the median uh, and not too much differentiation. 
I think, as I said, as we start to see more pressure on boards to really recruit high quality, diverse candidates, you might see this change. Um, Pete, I'll ask you, you know, to chime in. What, what's your thinking? Do you see this number increasing in the future given some of the additional pressures? You know, Ryan, I, I'm a little surprised by this data. Uh, yeah, Paula mentioned at the very beginning that boards are spending more time uh, at board work. It, not, not so much at meetings, but between board meetings. And that's what I've been seeing, too, especially when you get into issues around maybe a failed say on pay. The amount of time that a committee chair will spend on that is enormous. And what, what I'm surprised to see is that pay is flat at the board level, even though time commitments are greater. And when I think about board pay, I, I try to equate it to a, a time commitment issue, but it, it's not evolving that way, I'm, and I'm just surprised about it. And if you add in these time commitments with the goal overall to have more diverse boards, I'm just surprised pay is not going up more. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. I, I've certainly, you know, we witness it on a daily basis, but the, the workload, the time commitment, has certainly stepped up uh, in recent years, uh, and I don't see that going away anytime soon. Paul, I, I'm just curious about uh, your experience on boards. Uh, I know you mentioned the time commitment issue. Are you surprised that pay is not going up a little faster? I think it's just awkward for boards because, um, you know, you can you can be subjected to a lot of scrutiny and criticism, and um, at least the boards that I serve on, there's a significant reluctance to get too far outside of the lane. Yeah, no, I think, and that's exactly what we find in the data, Paula, that, you know, the spreads that you see between 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile in director comp is much less pronounced than you'd see in, you know, employee compensation or executive compensation for the exact reasons that you just mentioned. Next slide. Slide eight here is one of the um, slides that I was referring to that we are focusing on privately held organizations. So uh, as we've seen for, uh, amongst the pr publicly traded firms, about a 3% year over year increase in director comp. It's less than that uh, in the privately held companies, it's about one and a half, 1.3 percent year over year, slightly down from 2020. I assume that is probably more reflective of some uncertainty related to COVID um, still and some of the, the macroeconomic issues that we're facing more so than an ongoing trend. I would expect this number um, to increase more to that two and a half to three percent range going forward. But still, again, pretty modest bumps. Um, and privately held boards face, you know, obviously less scrutiny from uh, shareholders and so on and so forth, but certainly stepping up in terms of workload as well. I work with a lot of private companies and, you know, privately held boards are facing many of the same issues in terms of, you know, determining goal setting, um, ensuring that the, the right talent's in, in place, ensuring there's a a good succession plan in place. Um, so again, probably a, a little bit less than I would, would have expected and somewhat surprising in the data that it, that it is as low as it is year over year, given the increase in responsibility, even amongst privately held organization boards. Yeah, Ryan, I'll throw in one comment here. I think you have more experience than I with uh, the private company boards. I do have experience with um, portfolio companies held as private companies. And the, the one big difference I see, and it's a significant difference, is the comment that you made. Uh, at least on the compensation side, there is no ISS to worry about. The shareholders is a different group and, and probably is more knowledge about what the shareholders is expecting. And of course, you don't have the quarterly earnings calls to deal with. And I would say on the private boards, although serving on a board is a, a complicated task to do well, I think the demands are probably just less from a time perspective. Which may yeah, explain absolutely. Things. And you see that borne out in the pay, Pete. And I think, you know, typically the big dichotomy between the private company compensation and the public company board compensation is the absence of the equity vehicle. From a cash perspective, 
they tend mm-hmm. to be generally consistent. Um, so, yeah. so the delta really comes into the equity piece. And to your point, Pete, that's that's really to acknowledge the additional scrutiny and time associated with the role. Next slide. Slide nine is, a, is an interesting slide. It's um, And it's a slide that we uh, have shown for a while, and, and the messaging on this has continued to improve every year. And this is basically the prevalence of female board members kind of across all size categories. As you can see, and I'm looking more at the gender diversity rows that where we have some blue shading. Um, anywhere where there's a kind of a darker blue, that's a greater than a 10% year over year jump in terms of those numbers of female directors on boards. Um, So, you know, again, I think it's very encouraging. One thing, you know, for instance, the micro size group um, was a a fairly late adopter to this. But as you see, there, you know, 82% of micros now have at least one female director on the board, a a pretty significant jump from last year. So I think the message is, is percolating down even to the smallest firms. But one thing you do get from this chart is, you know, it, it, there is some correlation to comp- from an organizational size standpoint to how many female directors sit on those boards. So, for instance, if you look at the top 200, um, you know, there's 82% prevalence of boards that have greater three or more directors, female directors sitting on them, which, you know, again, a, a fairly significant jump from last year. But you can see how that number as you move down to the micro level, only 15%. Again, I anticipate those numbers to continue to trend upward across all of these size groups until they're more in line with that top 200, but a little bit slower to adopt. And Pete, I don't know if you'd have anything, I mean, which, are you seeing kind of a consistent theme amongst your clients in terms of a, um, you know, a more concerted effort to get female directors on, onto the board? Yeah, yeah. I, the quick answer is yes, and I remember during a prior discussion, Paul and I, and you discussed this one topic, and Paul and I have really the same experience, is that if you look over the last 18 months in particular, and you ask the question about gender diversity and diversity in, in general, there's been a lot of change on boards right now in the last 18 yeah. months, but before that, it was slow to change, but I'm seeing it uh, but just when we go to compensation committees and a new board member is introduced to the group, you see the difference pretty quickly. And, Paul, I think you said you had the same experience on your end. Absolutely. I mean, I've spent a fair amount of time working on this, and for many, many, many years, uh, the, the the percentage of female directors languished in the 12 to 15 percent. Mm-hmm. and um, now for it to be as high as it is is just so encouraging and if you do an analysis of the uh, percentage of new directors who are women or people uh, of diversity that number is also quite stunning yep totally agree and you know one thing you're obviously not getting on this chart because it's hard to glean from proxies is is you know the ethnic diversity but i imagine if we had been able to break that out it might not be as pronounced as the female, but it, it is certainly trending uh, in that direction in terms of, again, a increased focus on making sure not only we have gender diversity, but ethnic diversity on the boards as well. Next slide. Uh, slide 10, again, is a private company specific slide. Uh, and, and here we're looking at similar trends in terms of um, prevalence of women on boards, as well as just, you know, candidates from underrepresented groups. So that would be, you know, women, ethnic diversity. Um, Essentially, what we're seeing is a similar trend uh, amongst privately held firms in that there is an increased focus on getting women um, on boards, uh, as you can see across all kind of size categories in in the privately held, you know, less than 250, 250 to a billion, a billion to 10 billion and greater than 10 billion, they all have greater than one female director on the board. And as you get into that 250 to 1 billion, it's greater than two uh, at that point. And then, again, if you look in terms of has your board recently appointed a candidate from an underrepresented group recently, and this is within the last year, um, you know, 
a little over a third uh, of companies um, have appointed a candidate from an underrepresented group in the last year, which is a pretty significant um, turn, especially amongst, you know, as, as Pete mentioned earlier, a little bit less scrutiny among privately held organizations. But I think they're seeing the added value of diverse opinions and diverse backgrounds on these boards leading to, you know, better business ideas and better strategies. With that, Paul, I think I'll turn it over to you for our first poll question. Sure. Uh, next, we are going to ask people who are on the call today to just weigh in on whether the composition of your board is aligned with actual board gender goals. And the potential answers are, we don't have formal board gender goals. Yes, we are fully aligned. We expect to be fully aligned next year, or we expect to be fully aligned in two or more years. And I can just tell you that uh, of the three companies that I serve on uh, the board of, one is a top 200 company, the other two are micro cap, and we don't have any formal board gender goals in any of my organizations. Let's see how the audience responded. So it looks like 41% is the bucket that I would be in, and 54% are fully aligned, which is Pretty impressive. Let's go on to the next question, which is basically asking the same thing, uh, but related to board diversity goals. Is the composition of your board aligned with those goals? And again, either we don't have those goals, we're fully aligned, we expect to be aligned soon. Uh, and I would respond again that the boards I serve on do not have formal board diversity goals. Let's see how it is for the entire group of people on this call today. So in this instance, 55% of, of boards represented do not have formal board diversity goals, um, and 38% are aligned with where they want to be. Um, so we have more work to do on the board diversity uh, side of things. Uh, pretty clearly than we do on the on the gender diversity. On to Pete. Okay. You know, I, well, before we go on to the next slide, the one comment I'd have about those responses, uh, it's encouraging to see that. I would have expected, Paula, to see a little bit higher percentages in uh, in the comments around being uh, meeting goals within the next year or two. And that was actually mm -hmm. a pretty small percentage. I'm surprised by that. Very small. Yep. People are either, they, I mean, I think it, it's, um, the conversations I've been in on this topic um, remain, you know, commitment to having diverse slates for every opening and commitment mm -hmm. to working as aggressively as possible toward diversity. But, um, skepticism of having formal goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the other comment, too, is, you know, it just, it just takes time to recruit the candidates that you want. So we we've, we've all have become so specialized these days. Companies in their industry have become specialized. I would imagine in some cases if you're looking for a diverse candidate with a specialized background, that search just takes longer, I would imagine. Right, right. Sometimes it's industry specialization, and sometimes it is, um, you know, a more technical field. Um, but it, you know, on average, the boards I'm on, it takes about a year to bring a new director on. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, board pay, uh, this is a trend, I don't know, I've seen probably, Ryan, a good five years where there's less reliance on committee pay and more reliance on retainers and equities. I've seen this, seen this for a while. I think there's three broad reasons why this is happening. Uh, one is just simplicity. Is it really necessary to have a complicated board pay structure? Some will take that position. 
Uh, the other comment I've heard is, what does it really mean to serve on the committee if so much of the work is done outside of a committee or a board meeting? I've heard those comments too. Then another comment I heard for companies that have been in, uh, in the public markets for a while that typically have long tenured uh, directors, eventually everybody sits on all of the committees. You kind of rotate through the committees. So is it really necessary to deviate uh, or make a distinction about committee pay versus uh, retainers and, and equity grants. So I see this trend continuing uh, for a while. I don't know when it will stop, but Brian, um, any thoughts you want to add to that comment? Yeah, no, I mean, Pete, I'm hearing the same thing. I think simplicity, as you mentioned, is probably the number one driver of this. I, I also think the other point that you mentioned in terms of you know, the time commitments across these committees has basically normalized to a point where there's less distinct, you know, the audit used to be meeting so much more than comp and nom and gov that that's normalized a little bit. So there's just a less differentiation in terms of workload, as you mentioned, and with the amount of work that's happening at the board level and outside of the committees. Um, I agree with you. I, I don't see this trend slowing down, and I, I probably see it maybe even speeding up um, and becoming more prevalent amongst the smaller size groups. Um, well, is, this, is this data, is that consistent with your experiences? Yes. Uh, all three of my boards, when I first went on them, had meeting fees and, you know, all these different forms of compensation. And um, now it's simply an annual, uh, an annual compensation amount, usually paid quarterly uh, along with equity. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I expect this trend will continue for all the reasons we discussed. All right, next slide, please. Uh, full value stock continues to account for the largest portion of director pay. So I don't think that's a surprise to anybody generally, but I do have a couple of comments here. If you look at uh, the progression of total pay across the different sizes of the data cuts, uh, the, the proportions feel about right. You know, the larger companies will pay more. That's established for a long time. But I tell you what I think is a little bit surprising to me, or maybe a lot surprising to me, and that's the micro cut. The micro cut, is, when you're looking at very small companies, sometimes small companies are looking to preserve cash, and for that reason, they may have a, a heavier equity component, even at the board level. And maybe just uh, the philosophy of everybody should be heavier on, on equity at these micro companies, something I've heard before. And you, you definitely see that, by the way, when you when a private equity company takes a company public, you, you see that kind of philosophy. So it's surprising to me a little bit that, that the micro category doesn't have a greater proportion of stock. That's surprising a little bit. Um, I don't know. Ryan? Surprise you? Or yeah, I mean, I, I think some of the reason, Pete, in the micro section, and we talked a little bit about this, is some of the companies in that group are trading at such a low stock price that yeah. the use of a full value share to deliver meaningful value, you just have to deliver so many of them that they yeah. end up saying we're better off using cash because it's just, you know, it's it, it's very costly from a burn perspective and everything to utilize this many shares for our directors when we have to take care of the executives as well. So I think you're seeing a little bit of that and you kind of break out of that when you move to that small category, which is why you see that pop. Uh, but I think that mm -hmm. might be driving a little bit of this as well. Yeah, yeah. obviously there's an explanation for it. Uh, and the other comment, of course, is you see the stock options almost don't exist anymore at the board level. Now, that's a trend that's probably happened, I don't know, over many years, but uh, stock options clearly clearly are not favored at the board level. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, equity comprises over 50% of total director pay for all size categories. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Uh, but again, I'm going to go back to, it's really the same kind of comment I had in the last slide. If you look at the top 200, you can see uh, almost more than 90% rely heavily on, on equity and less so at the smaller companies. Again, it, and it's across the board, which is kind of surprising. So I thought there would be more uniformity on this kind of slide here with regard to um, 
equity being over 50% of the total pay package. Surprising to you, Ryan, or is that what you see in your world? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was. This is pretty consistent with what I would have expected. Um, I mean, again, I think micro, I, I can justify, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, this is generally consistent. I think with what I see across my clients that are in these various size categories. Okay. Paul, anything here that surprises you, or is this consistent with what you're seeing? Well, the, um, the two micro companies that I serve on the boards of rely heavily on equity for the total compensation package, and it's it, it's definitely more than 50% of total comp in yeah. both cases. All right. Okay, let's move on to um, equity wards. Next slide, please. You can see here equity grant practices, fixed, fixed value versus fixed shares, and uh, the, the vast majority of firms use a fixed value approach. So it's just simply meaning that uh, we want to grant uh, $100,000 of equity to our directors versus a fixed share approach, maybe instead of saying we want to grant 1,000 shares. Uh, that practice, I think, is pretty much ingrained. It certainly is consistent with how executive compensation is treated uh, with equity grants across the board. Now, there are times when that changes, and uh, you know this this example in the last I don't know the last three months now that we're entering a bear market in certain circumstances. Sometimes companies run into share problems, and at the board level, depending on how the executive compensation grants were handled. Sometimes uh, boards go back and reduce the equity value basing it on, on share availability. So that does happen sometimes, and I suspect uh, it did happen or well, may happen this year because of the problems with the depressed stock prices. Ryan, do you, are you having any clients that uh, – I suspect your clients mostly use the fixed value approach, but have you seen any clients that are running into share availability problems or a desire to, to reduce the board grant because of the current stock prices? Um, I, I mean, I've seen most of my clients are using fixed value just given the ability to kind of, you know, control the compensation a little bit stronger. Now, I do work yeah. with a number of micro clients that use more of a fixed share approach, and that's largely, again, driven by the fact that, you know, their stock prices are pretty low, and it's just easier to, to allow, you know, the shares to kind of drive it. Now, some of those are using options, so... Um, but I, I think I'm certainly seeing, um, in terms of companies that were using specific approaches to determining the share number on a fixed value approach, so let's say they were using the grant date to determine the share count on that fixed value, using more of a 60 mm -hmm. or 90 day smoothing average, Pete, to make to take out some of the recent anomaly uh, in terms of, you know, the... so. I've seen some efforts to smooth the approach to fixed value, let's call it that, but I haven't seen a full-on abandonment of the fixed value approach. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but this idea of using a, a 30 or 20-day average to determine the stock price for to determine number of shares to grant, I have a couple of clients that actually have taken that approach on the executive compensation program because of share availability problems. So it's interesting. Okay, I think we have a couple of polling questions coming up here. Right. So we'd like to get everybody that's involved with this call to weigh in on whether you expect to reduce the board equity grant value because of declining stock prices. And the options here are no or yes. We approved the 2022 board equity grant already, which was less than the target amount or the value we granted last year. Uh, we have not made the grant yet, but we may reduce the board equity value in 2022, or we have not made the grant yet, but we don't expect to reduce the board equity grant value in 2022. So if you all could weigh in on that, we'll give you a second and then move on to the poll results. Okay, 
So the overwhelming answer is no. Uh, we do not expect to reduce the board equity grant value because of declining stock prices. And coming in second, we haven't made the grant yet, but we don't expect to reduce the board equity grant value in 2022. I think that would be a, a challenging thing to do, apparently, for most of the companies represented here. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Any any other comments I, uh, on that, Ryan? Please. Yeah, I actually, I, I just going to make a comment here. I, I I drafted this question because I actually have a couple of clients that are in a, a unique situation, and it happens every once in a while where, because of the timing of a down market, there is a reduction in the the grant value for the executive compensation team. You know, most companies have specific uh, value targets. Uh, because of this depressed stock prices, the board has reduced the executive compensation grants. And there's a concern in some cases that where uh, where the board is granted stock on the shareholder meeting, there's a concern that a couple of months out, the share price would, would re, uh, restore itself and the board would get full grants while the executive team got a cutback. So I was curious to see what was going on out there because I've seen this happen before. I'm not surprised by the results. But it's interesting to see that some companies did face this issue, which I think can be a little bit difficult to deal with sometimes optically. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, we have one more poll question we'll move on to. How do you structure equity grants for new board members before the first annual granting date? And the choices, we make our first equity grant to board members at the annual granting date. We provide all new board members with a prorated equity grant when they begin board service based on the number of months worked from the start date to the annual granting date. Or we provide an equity grant at or around the date a new member begins service regardless of the months worked before the annual grant date. You could weigh in on your experience with that question. I'd appreciate it. All right, the majority answer is a prorated equity grant when new members begin board service based on the number of months worked. Um, Brian, Pete, any comments on that? that? That aligns with where I thought the answer would probably come out, Pete. I'm actually surprised there's as many are answered in the first one, yes. Um, I, I've seen just given, again, some of the um, – difficulty recruiting director is to make someone that joins mid-cycle wait until the annual grant um, can be a harder sell than it is if you kind of prorate them on the way in. Yeah. 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 I have a couple of comments on my end. I, I, I drafted this question because this was another issue we recently faced, a company thinking about, hey, are we treating our new directors right by making them wait till the uh, next shareholder meeting or the normal grant date to give an equity grant. And it just doesn't feel right that you're asking a director to join a, a board. You'll pay them cash compensation, but make them wait for the equity grant. It didn't feel right to me. So I'm actually not surprised by this answer because I know there's a range of practices out there. But it does bring up another question I have really for Ryan and for Paul, if you really are your view on this. Uh, if you look at the old days, it was something called an ad appointment grant, and what that simply meant is that at appointment you got a, a one-time special grant, and I would say in, as an inducement to join the board. The last time I checked the survey data, less than 15% of the companies have ad appointment grants. And in the environment that we're in now, where we are trying to create more diverse boards and trying to hire people with a highly specialized backgrounds, I am not. I am surprised that ad appointment grants aren't more popular. When the executive yeah, I mean, team recruits executives, they, there's, there's yeah, no it, issue about it. Yeah, yep. It's interesting, Pete, because I think you know it, that's a very interesting point. I think I have a number of like recent IPO clients where they all have an inducement um, award, and then I have a lot of established publicly traded firms, and none of them have an inducement award. Um, so, I, but I agree with you. I think it's something that obviously as people, as companies that are actively looking to recruit multiple board seats, 
it seems to be more of a prevalent practice. Like, you know, again, given recent IPO work, most of those companies are looking to fill a few board seats at the event or shortly thereafter. Um, so there's an added kind of focus on, okay, how do we get the right talent on the board? So I have seen a, a, a pretty big uptick in initial grants at that level. But to your point, um, you know, amongst my more established firms, um, it's, it's a pretty rare practice, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. Paul, is that consistent with your experience? I think my sample size is too small to add much value. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm still scratching my head, though, about this, why ad appointment grants aren't more popular in a day where it becomes harder and harder to recruit uh, diverse or specialized talent. But uh, my view on this has always been different in the world, it seems like. Pretty All right. Uh, can we move on, please? Next slide. Okay, stock ownership guidelines. Not much to say here other than they clearly are an established practice, and as you can see for very large companies, almost uniformly a top practice. Uh, I think if you're serving on a board, you expect that policy to be in place. I don't think there's any issues there. If you go down to the bottom piece on the holding period requirements, the one piece of data that I thought was a little bit interesting is when you talk about the type of holding guideline and uh, one line down, it talks about until or beyond retirement. If you look at the top 200, it says 46% of prevalence on that. I said, well, that feels awfully high to me, but I'm just wondering if there's a deferred comp election that someone might make to say, hey, I want to receive my shares at retirement. I, I just have a hard time explaining that data point. I, I don't know, Ryan, is that something you think about? I agree with you, Pete. I, I kind of had a similar reaction. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, I don't know. I'm not sure about your experience, Paula, but uh, it seems like many boards do have a, an opportunity to defer receipt of shares. So I expect those policies probably impact this data somewhat. I bet that's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Chair premiums. Now, this, this is a, a slide I think is interesting only because I don't think the data tells the whole story here, and, I, and I'll tell you why. The, when we talk about premium pay, and, and there's, there's a couple of levels of premium pay. It could be lead director. It could be a non-executive chair. It could be executive chair. I, I think what happens is the data doesn't capture the nuances of what that leadership role is. And, and what I mean by that is if we go back to the idea that there should be some, at least I think there should be some correlation between uh, pay and time commitments. If you're serving in a lead role, however you define it, in some cases the lead role might have some additional time commitments, and depending on the board, may have significant time commitments. The data can't differentiate among, uh, among those nuances. So I always suggest when, when boards look at leadership pay, they really take into account, to the extent that they can, is this a very time-consuming job? And if it is, I would say go outside of the market norms and set that pay appropriately. And if it is a job that maybe is not as time-intensive, maybe be more on the on the modest side of premium pay. But I think about it that way. Uh, Ryan, any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I no, I mean, I don't disagree. I mean, I you know, I, these. I, I think I think you're right. I mean, I I, I agree with what you said. I, I I don't have much else to add outside of that. I mean, I, my comment would be that lead director or committee chair pay at these levels is reasonable when everything is going well. But when things yeah. don't go well, uh, I have a friend who's just accepted uh, lead director role for two different organizations, and her comment was, um, you know, the the increase in compensation bears no relationship to the increase in time commitment, which I think yeah. is, can be true. Yeah, yeah. You know, and one simple example on the compensation side, if you fail, say, on pay, and the chair of the company gets involved, that can be extraordinarily time intensive. Yeah. And, and, you, and if there's no correlation in my mind between pay and the involvement from a time perspective in that particular issue. And that's just one example. If you have a challenging director, 
and the NOMGov chair has to deal with it. If you have, I mean, there are all kinds of things that can okay. go wrong in any of these committees. If you have a cybersecurity breach, if I mean, it just it goes on and on. Yeah, the CEO yep. transitions, uh, all kinds of issues. Exactly. Uh, to play. Right. I mean, and these issues really can be very time intensive. You can, you can see it. Okay, moving on, please. Okay, this slide has to do with um, retainers uh, vary by committee based on expertise and time commitments uh, by committee members. Uh, I think this is probably one of the reasons why board pay uh, boards want less complicated pay structures uh, because I I wonder if it even is worth trying to make a distinction for paying people who are not in a chair role. I mean, practice still exists. I don't think it certainly is a majority practice, but I always say that is, is do you really need to make that differentiation on pay for a member, not a chair? And Ryan, do you have a point of view on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right, Pete. I think that's becoming the prevailing mindset, and I think these numbers are going to trend down over time. I mean, you see amongst the top 200, it's already less yeah. than 50% prevalent to provide uh, you know, audit is just under 50%, but comp and gov are pretty low to provide any incremental compensation for committee members. I wouldn't be yeah. surprised, as I said, and you alluded to earlier, you know, kind of a push towards more simplification. You're going to see a lot of these incremental fees get built more into that annual cash retainer than you are going to see them probably yeah. going forward broken out by these membership retainers. And, Paul, I believe you serve both as a chair and as a member on these committees. Is there a reason in your mind why this kind of structure makes sense in certain cases? In in the on the three boards that I serve on, the committee chair does a lot of heavy lifting. And mm -hmm. committee members definitely participate and if there are challenging things they have to they have to step up and there's a bigger there's a bigger time commitment but the committee chair role is more time consuming in my experience yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what i hear also yeah, i would agree okay. yeah, i'm keeping my eye on the clock here so i'm just pushing yeah we gotta here. we gotta pick up the tempo here guys Okay, I've got uh, one more slide, and I think uh, we can wrap it up. All right. Uh, just one more comment here. We kind of covered this already. Uh, when you're looking at leadership pay, uh, the, the situation really should dictate the amount of pay. So if a CEO retiring to an executive chair and then retiring out of the company is a different situation than an uh, ongoing executive chair. So the pay levels, the data helps you think about the pay levels, but it really is more nuanced than that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ryan or Paul. No, I mean, I, th I think you said it well. Yeah, not, not much to add. The data pretty much speaks for itself here, but I agree with you. Okay, and then I think we can, why don't we just wrap it up with just a couple of final thoughts here. Uh, uh, Paul said it well almost an hour ago. Uh, responsibilities are evolving and expanding. Uh, and uh, especially with ESG and HCM. So the job is getting more complicated. Diversity continues to be a top priority. We see it firsthand. Uh, private companies pay less than public company boards, but uh, there are reasons for that. That may change over time. We don't know. And the board leadership pay can vary a lot, and we talked about that in some detail. Uh, so let, let me pause here for any uh, questions from or comments from Paula or Ryan or questions from the audience. We have a number of uh, questions that are relevant to all of the topics that we've covered. And so I think I'll just start by, um, by uh, start with one of them. Uh, other surveys show higher committee chair and lead director pay. Your numbers haven't changed for a number of years. Why is that? Of course, I don't know what other surveys this uh, participant <laughs> Since, since I since I lead a lot of the NACD uh, work, I, I'll speak to this. Um, you know what we try to do in regards to the director comp report is we try to keep. We look at 1,400 companies across these different size cuts, um, and we try to keep the companies consistent year to year. So we try every year to look at the same data set in terms of how are these exact same companies changing year to year. 
rather than having a different sample size or sample every year in terms of, okay, here's a whole new set of companies. So we're really trying to look apples to apples each year, which I think a lot of surveys probably are not doing where they'll just take the data that they get. All of the data that we are pulling as well is publicly available information. These are, all of this information comes from proxies. Um, the methodology you'll see in the NACD director report is you know, consistent with what we've used in the past. Um, and I, I don't know what other surveys are being referred to here, but again, I think the methodology we try to adhere to is just a very consistent year-over-year -year approach, not only in how things are being calculated, but also who the constituents reporting the data in are. Yes, yes. Yeah. Ryan, I I'll add one very comment. Helpful. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just one, yeah, just one comment. I'll make it brief. Uh, sometimes you see significant variations if you're looking at your own proxy group. They have 15 companies versus, or a specialized group of proxy companies versus uh, public company data. So you, depending on the composition of the data set, you might see certain differences. Maybe that was the reference. I don't know. Yeah, good point. Anecdotally, um, my experience is consistent with the data that um, there's very little change in the in the incremental compensation for being a committee member or a, a committee leader. Um, another interesting question, uh, have you seen examples of special pay for directors during a period of extreme crisis? And I'll just give a personal example. Um, this wasn't, I wouldn't describe it as a period of extreme crisis, but I was recruited to a public company board um, and asked to lead a CEO succession process almost immediately. And, and um, of course, many people participated in it, but um, some of the key participants did receive uh, a special cash award when that process concluded successfully that was not discussed up front. Uh, I don't know if uh, Ryan and Pete, you've seen examples of things like that? I, yeah, I mean, I, Paula, my experience very similar to yours. I mean, I, I have clients where, who will get involved in things like M&A activity uh, where they'll create a special committee for a specific period of time to handle the responsibilities associated with that type of work. Um, and it will be a paid type of, you know, service. So there, there is some acknowledgement to that. Um, so that's generally where I kind of see it. What about you, Pete? Yeah, yeah I would say it's, I've seen it. It's rare. And I'd say boards are generally conservative, getting back to the points made earlier, and generally uh, are not uh, are concerned about trying to establish pay for special work because there's an argument that says when you're on the board, you do what's required. So I'd say it's, it's rare, but they do happen occasionally. Yeah, that's a, a, good, a good caveat. Um, how about this yeah. one? What does compensation look like for non-executive directors of venture-backed startups. Does either of you have experience with that? I'll let you go first, Pete, uh, and then I'll chime in. I'm, I'm just I'm pausing on that one. I, 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 can't, I haven't seen a, a data set on that in a while, so I don't have a good answer on that. Yeah, I mean, I have a few clients in that sort of space. I would say they tend to be equity-heavy type of programs. Um, they tend to sometimes utilize be more willing to utilize stock options than restricted stock. Um, but that's, those are kind of the, the main caveats I see associated with director comp of those types of organizations. Here's another sort of similar question. Do you see performance-based restricted stock awards being paid to independent directors? I do not typically see that. I, I mean, I'm, it's probably done and somewhere, but uh, I, it's not something that I would recommend or something that I typically see. What about you, Pete? Yes, yeah, same answer. I mean, you know, what we found out, if you do proxy research, you'll find examples of almost anything, literally almost anything. But it, it, I would say it has to be in the extreme rare category. Yeah, 
More, more rare than the um, than a side committee being, you know, an additional committee being brought in to to be paid. I would say performance equity is on the rarer side of the the equation there. Yeah, I, I agree with that comment too, Ryan. Um, another question: um, Are you seeing pay uh, for? some of the new committees that are becoming more prevalent, like risk, ESG, strategy, those kinds of committees? I might answer this question a little bit differently. I'm not seeing new committees being formed, although I'm sure that is uh, what's happening. I would say when you think about um, ESG, for example, I think boards are understanding or discussing where that responsibility should lie within an existing committee or at the full board level, as opposed to creating new committees. I see more of that. I agree, with, I agree with you, Pete. Yeah, yeah and I that's agree. consistent with my experience, too. Um, in fact, I'm just working for one of my boards on a, you know, framing up a discussion about, you know, even drilling, certainly risk, ESG, mm -hmm. um, cybersecurity, um, corporate culture. I mean, there are lots of topics that um, could go either to the full board or could go into right. uh, the committees that are in place. And um, and and we're taking the approach of just getting clarity amongst ourselves about how we want to tackle those issues. Yeah, that's that's what I see Paul happening on my end too. Yep, agreed. Please give some examples of stock ownership guidelines. I mean, typically in, for director compensation, the ownership guidelines will be a multiple of the annual cash retainer. And they usually give you a time frame, let's say of three to five years to achieve that. And just throwing out kind of very high level 20,000 foot numbers, it's generally somewhere around, let's say three X uh, the annual cash retainer is the required ownership guideline. Um, but, Pete, any differing opinion on your end? No, the only comment I would add to it is that 3X is, is so common, unlike the executive plans that may have more variation in design. It seems at the board level that 3X you see, oh, you see almost every single time. Yeah, yeah. As with anything board comp, a little bit less variation, a lot more... Uh, reverting to kind of the, the mean. Wonderful. Well, um, Ryan and, and Pete, thank you so much for bringing your deep expertise to all of us today. I am going to say thank you to both of you and hand this over to Sarah, who will bring us to the end. Thank you, Paula. We ran out of time, but we'll follow up via email if you submitted a question to the panel. I have a few quick reminders for you before we get to the evaluation questions and conclude the program. You can find archives of all previous webinars in the series at nacdonline.org slash webinars and perlmeyer.com slash knowledge dash share. As I mentioned earlier, you will automatically receive one credit toward maintaining your NACD certification for participating in the live webinar. If you have any questions about either program, please visit us at nacdonline.org or contact us using the contact information you see here in the slide deck. Thank you again to Paula, Peter, and Ryan for their excellent presentation. Audience, before you go, we have a, pre, a brief post-webinar survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as we end the webcast. We would really appreciate it if you took the time to answer these questions. Your feedback helps us improve our webinar series. This concludes our program. Thank you all again and have a wonderful afternoon.